In this program, we're going to take a broad look at Sumerian religion. Why? Well, for over 3,000 years, the gods of ancient Sumer were worshipped by millions of people who lived not only in the Near East, but well beyond. The ideas and beliefs promoted from this religion influenced and played a defining role in the public and private lives of the citizens of Mesopotamia. It gave their rulers legitimacy and inspired their art and literature. It also was the basis for many of their laws. Long after the Sumerian language ceased to be spoken in day-to-day -day life, Sumerian religion thrived among the newer peoples who entered Mesopotamia. The Akkadians, Amorites, Assyrians, Kassites. Whoever permanently settled in this land, for the most part, adopted the deities and basic tenets of Sumerian religion without too many fundamental differences. For these and many other reasons, Understanding Sumerian religion is so important for comprehending the great civilization that flourished in the land that we today call Mesopotamia. So, without further ado, let's begin. Whatever the true origin of the Sumerians may be, most scholars agree that they adopted a great deal from cultures and civilizations that existed in Mesopotamia before their arrival over 5,000 years ago. Our knowledge of Mesopotamian religious practices and morality come from a variety of texts that include epic tales, myths, rituals, hymns, prayers, seals, and inscriptions left behind by various kings and other rulers. The earliest of these come from the period we call the Early Dynastic Period of Sumer, which are the years roughly between 2900 to 2350 BCE. Of course, Sumerian religion goes back much further but those are the years from which we start to see a lot of written and other archaeological evidence that allow us to get a more comprehensive picture of their religious beliefs and practices. For the most part, the Sumerians were polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many deities in the forms of gods, goddesses, and various spirits. These deities were responsible for various aspects of creation, whether it be the rising and setting of the sun, waxing and waning of the moon, rain and weather, love and war, or really any natural phenomenon or emotion. For all of these things that I just mentioned, there was some god, goddess, or spirit associated with it. To help explain how these divine beings and the universe operated, the Sumerians had many myths where the gods and goddesses were superstars in some sort of cosmic play. They lived in a spiritual world that was in many ways a replica of the human society of Sumer. Like those of ancient Greece, these gods and goddesses had their own unique personalities and were very similar to human beings in their appearance and temperament. The difference, of course, was that they had supernatural powers and were immortal. Well, most of them were. Occasionally, you did have a few gods or goddesses fight and kill each other with the loser turning into some sort of natural phenomenon, like a constellation or a river. Just like in human society, the deities of ancient Mesopotamia were not all of equal status. At the lowest rung of the ladder were various spirits, which could be either helpful like angels, or harmful like demons. Above these were deities that were in charge of nature or various trades, such as gods of the wind, or those who protected blacksmiths. There were also gods and goddesses associated with animals and their protection. After this were the gods and goddesses of the netherworld, such as Nurgle or Erishkigal. Then there were gods associated with war, such as Ninurta, followed by gods and goddesses of astral phenomenon, such as the sun, moon, and stars. These deities, such as Nana and Shamash, were considered to be very powerful since they controlled natural phenomenon whose operation at the time was incomprehensible to humans. At the top of the Sumerian hierarchy were the three great gods of An, Enlil, and Enki. An was the god of the sky and was believed to have been the most powerful of all. His main temple was in the city of Uruk, and like Zeus of ancient Greece, he was the father of many other gods and goddesses. He was also somewhat aloof, at least in the affairs of humans. I guess when you're ruling the entire universe, you really don't have time to take upon the requests and appeals of the common folk. 
His symbol was the star. In the Akkadian language, he's called Anu. Ansan Enlil, though, was different. He took a more active part in the world of humans, and for this reason, he was often invoked by kings and commoners alike. His name means Lord Air, and he's associated with life and breath. His role was to keep order in the world. It was also he who bestowed kingship on an individual and gave them legitimacy. Enlil was arguably the most important of all of the gods. One hymn to the god describes him as such, and I quote, Without Enlil, the great mountain, no city would be built, no settlement founded, no stalls would be built, no sheepfolds established, no king would be raised, no high priest born. The rivers, their floodwaters would not bring overflow. The fish in the sea would not lay eggs in the cane break. The birds of heaven would not build nests on the wild earth. In heaven, the drifting clouds would not yield their moisture. Plants and herbs, the glory of the plain, would fail to grow. In fields and meadows, the rich grain would fail to flower. The trees planted in the mountain forest would not yield their fruit. So as you can see, Enlil was an extremely important god. Possibly the most beloved god to the Sumerians was Enki. That was his Sumerian name, but in Akkadian, he was called Ea. He was the god of rivers, lakes, wells, basically any source of fresh water. Something, of course, that was so vital to life in the arid deserts of Mesopotamia. He was also known for his intelligence and was the patron of the sciences, technology, and the arts. Interestingly, he was also the patron of magicians, so perhaps what we'd call science was seen as a form of magic in ancient times. Now, I mentioned that he was especially beloved by the people of Mesopotamia because unlike some of the other deities, Enki seemed to have been the god who did his best to look out for men and women. For example, it was he who saved mankind from the Great Flood, the same one that's mentioned in the book of Genesis. He also aided man and taught him how to use the resources of the world, such as cattle for farming. Overall, he was a pretty good god to have on your side. Another extremely popular god was Nana, known as Sin or Suin in Akkadian. He also has another name, Enzu, meaning Lord of Wisdom. Appropriately, he's a god that's associated with divination and astronomy. Archaeologists have dug up hundreds, perhaps thousands, of hymns and prayers devoted to Nana, especially in his native or patron city of Ur. Utu, known as Shamash in Akkadian, is the son of the moon god Nana, and also the god of the sun. He's associated with justice and fair play. In fact, he's the god that you see on the famous stele of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, towering above his law code. While the trinity of An, Enlil, and Enki held a huge sway over the universe, Sumerian religion also had several powerful goddesses as well. One was the mother goddess, Ninghursag, also known as Ninma or Nintu. Another very popular goddess, perhaps the most popular, was Inanna, who in Akkadian was called Ishtar. She's actually the twin sister of the moon god, Nana, and held many interesting roles for not only was she the goddess of love and fertility, but also of war. In fact, many kings, including Sargon of Akkad, were devoted to Inanna and took her as their protector and champion when going into battle. Now these were just some of the most popular and powerful of Sumer's gods and goddesses. There were plenty of others, and I'd love to go into all of them, but we just don't have enough time. We'll save them for other programs. Speaking of Sumerian literature, let's take a look at some of it that deals specifically with creation. With regard to the world, the Sumerians believed that the earth was a flat disk surrounded by a rim of mountains and floating in an ocean of sweet water. 
Resting atop these mountains, but separated from the earth, was the sky. Below the earth was the netherworld, where the spirits of the dead dwelled. All of this was encompassed in a gigantic bubble in a boundless, uncreated, primeval ocean of salt water. The question then becomes, who created this world, and how was it created? And what is the role of men and women in this world? The answer to this is varied. One story attributed the creation of the universe to a sort of general assembly of all of the gods and goddesses, while another says that only four of them were involved. And what about humans? There are actually a few stories, but the most popular is called Enki and Ninma. In this story, or myth rather, the lesser gods, burdened with the task of looking after the world, complained to the mother goddess telling her that they needed someone to help them. She then sent word to her son Enki and urged him to create a substitute to free the gods from their burdensome work. Enki told Ninma to knead some clay and then put it into her womb. After this, she magically gave birth to the first humans. There are many more myths and stories, and we'll go over some of them in future programs, because they're really quite interesting. The Sumerians, and later the Babylonians and Assyrians, were in awe of and looked up to their gods and goddesses. I like the way that one author describes it. He writes that the Sumerians viewed their gods, and I quote, As servants look to their good masters, with submission and fear, but also with admiration and love. For kings and commoners alike, obedience to divine orders was the greatest of qualities, as the service of the gods was the most imperative of duties. The Mesopotamians put their confidence in their gods. They relied upon them as children rely upon their parents. They talked to them as their real fathers and mothers, who could be offended and punish, but who could also be placated and forgive. While the priests were in charge of carrying out various rituals, it was the job of everyone, from kings down to the common person, to send offerings to the temples and ziggurats, as well as to attend to religious ceremonies and festivals. That was a null. Like in modern religions, for example Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, really any of the popular religions that exist in our world today. The Sumerians were also commanded by their deities to do good things. For example, to live an ethical life in terms of their conduct and dealings with others. I mention this because many in the modern world simply dismiss a lot of these ancient religions as being a bunch of superstitious practices and rituals without any true moral center to them. This was definitely not the case with Sumerian religion. The gods and goddesses didn't simply want offerings, sacrifices, and scrupulous attention to religious injunctions. A person also had to live a good and righteous life, show kindness and compassion to others, and also act justly. One hymn states, and I quote, To the feeble show kindness, do not insult the downtrodden, do charitable deeds, render service all your days. Do not utter libel, speak what is of good report, do not say evil things, speak well of people. As a reward for piousness and good conduct, the gods gave man help and protection in danger, comfort in distress and bereavement, good health, honorable social position, wealth, numerous children, long life, and happiness. So I hope that this short program has given you a glimpse of ancient Sumerian religion and the role that it played in the lives of those living in ancient Sumer. As always, thanks for stopping by the channel. I really appreciate it. Please like, comment, and subscribe and follow History with Sai on social media. Thanks again, and have an awesome day.